on this edition of Independent Sources, legitimizing the municipal ID, how officials intend to make the New York City identification attractive to all New Yorkers. This is really will expand the universe of every single New York City resident, but particularly our children. And a dangerous divide, why failing education and prison systems are contributing to the radicalization of some French citizens. For a lot of, uh, uh, of uh, kids who grew up in France, mm -hmm. it's uh, impossible to find work, it's impossible to uh, get a good ed education, it's impossible to integrate in society. Those stories and more coming up on Independent Sources. Welcome to Independent Sources, bringing you news from New York's ethnic and immigrant communities. I'm Abby Ashola. After a rocky start with its website, the city's municipal ID program has already taken off, with some centers reporting that they're booked with appointments through March. Gary Pierre Pierre sat down with City Council Speaker Melissa Mark Viverito to talk about the rollout of what's being called the country's largest municipal ID program. Council Speaker uh, Mark Viverito, uh, tell us about why this ID program. Well, I mean, the NYC ID, mm -hmm. right, the New York City ID card is the largest municipal ID program in the country. Okay. And uh, we based it on experience from other cities as well that have mm -hmm. implemented uh, an ID program, but clearly nothing at the scale of what New York City is with 8.3 million people. And this is an ID card for every single person that lives here. Yeah, because at first people thought it was specifically for immigrants, no, undocumented And immigrants. that's a misunderstanding, okay. right? And it's being misrepresented that way. We say that there's benefits for every sector of our community to having an official form of identification. Mm -hmm. This is an ID that is going to give you access to city services. Mm -hmm. um, as we go along, a lot more benefits are being attached to it, but right now, uh, you can have free membership for a year to 32 of our cultural institutions in this city. Such as, give us so you, you have the, the museums, right? And basically you have the Brooklyn Botanical Garden, you've got the New York Botanical Garden, uh, the Queens Botanical, you've got the zoos, uh, you've got museums like the Met Museum. This is really will expand the universe of every single New York City resident, but particularly our children, where sometimes maybe having to pay a fee to get into these institutions poses a barrier. But it so gives you benefits like that. It also, uh, is being accepted by 10 different financial institutions. I don't have the names offhand, but people can use that, those financial institutions, to open up bank accounts, for instance. Mm -hmm. You also have the library systems that are officially allowing the card to be used to check out books from the library system, all three library systems. So that is off the bat, mm -hmm. what we are doing. And again, it's, it's a benefit to every single sector of our community. So whether you're a, uh, whether you're a senior citizen, whether you are a person in a transgender, uh, a member of the LGBTQ community, uh, whether you are documented or not documented, mm -hmm. this is an ID card for every single New Yorker, and it's a formal form of ID that also will be accepted by the NYPD. Where can people apply for this card? So the, there's going to be enrollment centers throughout the city of New York, so the best thing that people could do is to call 311 and you will, they will let them know exactly what the closest enrollment center is. Right now, we have lines out the door, okay. um, and really it's already uh, being, uh, a lot of people are already expressing a lot of interest to the point where we may have to start giving appointments, right, to people <laughs> because the lines are, are getting really long. So that's a good thing, that because people are expressing an interest, our, our hope is that we can continue to get the word out there and encourage uh, members of our community in all sectors of our city to apply and to ask more questions about how they can enroll. The card is free for the first year. Right. The, the plan right now, and, and it may continue to be free, but okay. definitely for this first year, there will be no charge. You anticipated my next ID. question, did you? Yes. <laughs> no, I mean, the, the hope is that we can continue for it to okay. be free. And obviously, we have to make sure that the costs uh, can be covered. But, uh, but that's the hope. And then uh, the membership to the cultural institutions will be free for the first year, mm -hmm. and then that's uh, another conversation that can happen down the road. Okay. Now, what uh, efforts are being made to make sure that these sort of called multi-services that are ubiquitous in every immigrant community to, to not take advantage of people, charge them fees mm -hmm. for a card that's free, uh, mm -hmm. or in other uh, ways that they can, you know, uh, abuse right. uh, people who are looking for uh, identification cards. Well, there's two things I would say. One is that there are security features on the card that will maintain and preserve 
the security of the card, right? Mm -hmm. So it's not going to be easily duplicated. It can't be easily duplicated. But yes, there's always going to be those individuals that want to take advantage. So that's where the partnership with ethnic media and partnership with mainstream media and partnership with our community-based organizations comes in, that they make sure that they get the most accurate information out there to all parts of our city so that people really know where they should be seeking the services, where they should be seeking the help. Uh, anybody that approaches someone and says, well, I can help you, should already be wary, right? Because this is something you have to officially go to a site and sign up for. So mm -hmm. that's important, and I think calling 311 uh, or uh, our partnership with media in all levels of our city should also help get that information out there. What lessons did you learn uh, from other cities, like you mentioned San Francisco, I think Hartford, Connecticut, and other places that have similar programs? What w has been their experience and, and what will we build, be building from their experience here in New York? Well, I mean, the, 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 may, uh, the commissioner of the mayor's office of immigrant affairs was talking recently at a press conference. Nisha where she was saying, Right, Nisha Agarwal was talking about how in looking at the Los Angeles ID card, for instance, they really put a lot of, of value in having the, the public libraries be part of the rollout and be enrollment centers. Mm -hmm. Most a lot of, There's going to be a lot of public libraries here in New York that are going to be enrollment centers. But learning from the experience of LA on, on, the, in, uh, on having the uh, library system be a part of the rollout and of the enrollment. Mm -hmm. And then also, I think, in, in terms of, of uh, San Francisco, that was studied as well, and New, uh, New Haven, I believe, Connecticut, was the other one where they are. But as you all know, those cities, in comparison to New York, are really, um, you know, really small. So, so we do learn maybe on the design of the card, which I think San Francisco helped with, like, the design of the card and looking at that model. Uh, but we're also going to be implementing things on our own that also will hopefully serve as models for other municipalities that are possibly looking at doing this in the near future. So we're going to continue that dialogue and partnership with other cities and, and, uh, and continue to expand this card. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Council Member Melissa Mark Viverito, thanks for joining us. Gracias. Thank you. De nada. Residents interested in getting the ID can go to the website nyc.gov slash IDNYC or call 311. Still to come on the show, digging deeper into what's behind the recent terror attacks in France. Before that, Crystal Lowe has some other news. Thanks, Abby. Here's a look at some headlines from New York's ethnic and community media. From the Brooklyn paper, some housing activists are urging Mayor Bill de Blasio to put an end to a housing development project that some are calling discriminatory. They say the project caters mostly to the ultra-Orthodox Jewish community, leaving out Latinos and Blacks. The new housing is located in the Broadway Triangle, on the border of Williamsburg, Bushwick, and Bedford-Stuyvesant. Members of the Broadway Triangle Community Coalition say that the ultra-Orthodox builders are constructing three- and four-bedroom apartments meant for larger Hasidic families. The coalition of more than 40 community groups is asking Mayor de Blasio to reinterpret an injunction issued in 2012 that halts all construction in the area bordered by Broadway until the issue is resolved. The Mott Haven Herald reports on Mexican Student Association founder Angelo Cabrera. Cabrera entered the United States illegally in 1990 when he was 15. He recently returned to Mexico to change his immigration status. However, his request to re-enter the U.S. legally was denied by immigration authorities. Cabrera's program, MASA, offers tutoring to students and help for parents struggling to cope with the city's educational bureaucracy. According to the paper, Mexicans are dropping out of school in higher numbers than any other group. Cabrera says he wanted to change his status so that he could accept a job at his alma mater, Baruch College, and reverse that trend. El Diario La Prensa reports, New Jersey Cubans are confused over new guidelines under the Obama administration's lift on Cuban travel regulations. Under the new measures, U.S. nationals will be allowed to travel to Cuba under 12 categories without applying for a special license issued by the government. This new announcement leaves many Cuban nationals lost as to what new paperwork they will need to meet the new requirements. The paper interviewed Robert Guild, the vice president of Marzul, one of the largest travel agencies arranging trips to Cuba. He says that he has received several phone calls from customers who are confused over the new rules. For example, high school students are now able to travel under the new guidelines. He expects that the new measure will increase his agency's sales. The Brooklyn Daily Eagle reports that the Arab American Association of New York is urging its membership to support a proposal to change the 2020 U.S. Census form to include a designation for people of Middle Eastern heritage. Currently, Arab Americans usually check the box labeled white. 
The association believes that their community has remained somewhat invisible because there is currently no designated box for people of Middle Eastern and North African descent. Advocates believe that changing the form will provide more inclusive data collection and highlight this community's needs. And finally, Voices of New York reports on several artists' response to police brutality. A new multimedia exhibit opened on January 17th at the Smack Mellon Gallery in Brooklyn. The exhibit called Respond features hundreds of works from paintings to videos calling for justice in the wake of the grand jury's decision not to indict a police officer in connection with the death of Eric Garner. The exhibit will run from now until February 22, 2015. Those were just a few headlines from the city's ethnic and community media. Independent sources will be right back. Thanks for staying tuned. We saw what happened in France in January, the terrorist attacks that left 17 people dead. Beyond those scenes is an issue that remained unresolved for years. Sarah Pizan spoke to Emmanuel Saint Martin, the founder and editor in chief of the website French Morning, about how increasing racial and social disparities have contributed to a dangerous divide. Thanks for being with us, Emmanuel. Thank you. So, how has France growing ethnic segregation fueled what happened earlier this month? It's always a very tough question. Obviously, it's difficult to have a, to put a direct link. Uh, between uh, something like that that's beyond comprehension mm -hmm. and and uh, a social situation and, and social issues in a, in a country uh, but uh, the, the link is, is being made by a lot of people, and, and uh, you have to understand that those people uh, the, the attackers uh, were uh, raised in, uh, in in France, mm -hmm. uh, went to school in France, and then at one point suddenly decided to go uh, in the Middle East uh, to fight uh, the jihad and, and, and came back. So uh, there is an issue uh, with uh, mm -hmm. hundreds of, of uh, young people. There is a number around 15, 1,500 uh, who went to fight in uh, in the Middle East mm -hmm. and came back, and all of them were, were brought up in, uh, in France. So, mm -hmm. uh, of course, it raises question about um, why? Yeah. Why us? Is it a question of a model? Do we have a different model in France? All those questions are being are being uh, asked now, and the, the, the French Prime Minister used uh, the word uh, um, uh, apartheid yeah. to talk about the, about uh, what's going on in the French uh, mm -hmm. banlieue, uh, exactly. which is a word for, for suburbs, but means means mainly uh, areas, neighborhoods uh, where there is segregation going on. Mm -hmm. um, it, it took a lot of hit for using that word. Mm -hmm. uh, it's contrary to a lot of the French values. The people, uh, French people, even the most liberal people, maybe uh, see themselves and, and see the nation, and and they don't like mm -hmm. that we use that because it's a, it's it's a way to say uh, our model uh, failed in mm -hmm. many ways. There is, in fact segregation in those areas, in those neighborhoods, even though, if, of course, it's not, uh, it's not uh, by law. It's mm -hmm. In that sense, it's not apartheid. But there is no doubt there is, uh, there is a segregation. And for, for a lot of, uh, uh, of uh, kids who grow up in France, mm -hmm. it's uh, impossible to find work. It's impossible to uh, get a good ed education. It's impossible to integrate in society. Mm -hmm. in, that, in that regard, uh, what has been happening uh, has been happening in uh, in in France for um, now 40 years mm -hmm. um, can can be linked directly to uh, to these kind of things. Yeah, you you raised up education, and I, I want to talk about that. What role has France's strict secular system in schools played in fostering um, feelings of you know discrimination for Muslim communities? Has it affected? There, there is a sense in France that if you if you want to, to have a united nation, mm -hmm. uh, you have not to erase your beliefs, but to put them in a second um, you know in a second plan, second um, uh, in the background mm -hmm. uh, in a way, and uh, that's what we call laicite, mm -hmm. uh, which is supposed to be freedom of, uh, of religion, but it's, it's it's taken and understood in a very different way. It is taken and understood in this country right. in the U.S. Uh, laicite means there should be no religion at all in the French public school, public mm -hmm. systems, for example. Mm -hmm. So that's why uh, we had this law a few years back uh, where it's, uh, it's forbidden for, for, for kids and, and students to go to school with the hijab, mm -hmm. uh, for example, the veil, the Muslim veil. Uh, the reason for that is that, in uh, the same way, it's forbidden to have any kind of uh, Sip, yes. uh, cross mm -hmm. or any any other religious uh, expression or religious sign. Right. Uh, the idea is that if you if you allow that, then you allow uh, uh, religion in the school, mm -hmm. and there is no place for religion mm -hmm. in the school. But the the problem with that 
is that a lot of people don't understand that that way. They understand it as a, a, a way for the state to tell them you cannot express mm -hmm. your religion and you cannot uh, uh, believe what you want to believe. Right. Uh, so, of course, that's that's a big, big issue. And, and that's how it's uh, it's understood by, by a lot of people, even moderate, uh, you know, Muslims around the world and, and people from any f any faith. Uh, there is a French specificity in that area, uh, in that regard. And, uh, and and a lot of questions are being uh, are being asked about that uh, right, right now in France. Because that's been a hot topic for a while. But since the attacks, um, the Minister of Education announced a plan to invest about 250 million euros uh, to, in, uh, to instill the, um, the, the effort to reinforce those secular beliefs and system in the schools because they haven't really been followed or, I guess, accepted. How is this being received by French immigrant groups are they even further upset by this or is it is it still being welcomed or it's 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 tough to say that because it's a diverse those communities are as, as diverse mm -hmm. as any community right. so uh, i don't think there is one way for french muslims to see uh, mm -hmm. that issue and a lot of french muslims uh, of um, french people from muslim descent mm -hmm. are, are, are very comfortable with mm -hmm. those ideas okay. they're brought up with them uh, and they think that there should be a strict separation between the state and the religion mm -hmm. uh, but at the same time they also see that that strict separation is also a way for some people uh, to discriminate against mm -hmm. against others uh, so it's a fine line it's difficult to understand but for a lot of for, for a lot of Muslims and people from Muslim countries who, who, who suffered in their countries of uh, you know religious oppression mm -hmm. uh, uh, there is something to be said for this uh, French idea of uh, we don't want to talk about religion in public space and in, mm -hmm. in, in, uh, in especially yeah. in school. Uh, so that way we won't, we won't import those problems into mm -hmm. school. The problem with that is that those problems come into school anyways. Right. And if you have this attitude, this strict attitude where you don't want to talk about it, then maybe you, you leave space for the more extremist people. Mm. If there is no space at all, no, no discussion about religion in school, uh, then the only people who talk about it are the yeah, people who are extremists. Uh, yeah. So that's kind of questions that are raised. A lot of, we've heard a lot of uh, Muslim um, um, leaders in, in the country, in France, uh, who spoke obviously against the attacks. Uh, but also about the need uh, to find a place mm -hmm. uh, for, uh, for, for, for Islam and for religions. Uh, it's not a new topic. Uh, mm -hmm. It's been talked about for, for decades in France, of course, but, uh, but of course it's reinforced by what happened. And, and just to, to briefly now switch to the, the prison topic, why is there a greater percentage um, of France, people that go to prison, why is there more and more of them being radicalized? What, what is happening in French prisons? What happened in any prison? I guess, <laughs> in, uh, in advanced countries uh -huh. uh, where it's not a place for integration, it's not a place for reinsertion, it should be, but it's not. Mm -hmm. uh, so the same way uh, in this country, um, the majority of people who get out of jail, we go back to jail. We know that, mm -hmm. unfortunately, from, from numbers. The same way uh, uh, in, uh, in, in France, it's not the, the, the uh, prison have their own uh, rules mm -hmm. and their own way to integrate people who come into prison mm -hmm. and, and and religion because there is a higher percentage of, of Muslims uh, religion has come to play a big a big role in that mm -hmm. uh, and uh, there is uh, you know you have the mafia who have some uh, or, or the, uh, some kind of organization in mm -hmm. there but you also have some kind of religious extremist organization and uh, and uh, a lot of those kids who you know have been arrested uh, uh, because they want to they want to uh, do the jihad in uh, abroad and came back or, or didn't come back. Uh, a lot of them actually were radicalized in prison mm. in France, and yeah. that's a, that's a big issue. So there are ideas now uh, tr to try to uh, not put them together, mm -hmm. uh, but also there is the, also the issue of how you get you you keep peace in a prison. And for a lot of uh, administrators in prison, it's a way to keep peace because those. People are usually more peaceful mm -hmm. in terms of discipline and, and, and the way they behave in the, right. in the prison than, uh, uh, than, than others. So, um, so there's all those issues of uh, basic issues in how you, run a, how you run a prison. But it ha that has become a, a big issue for, uh, for France too, yeah. Okay, well, thank you very much, Emmanuel. Thank you. When we come back, an Ethiopian and an Egyptian director bring a long-awaited film to the big screen.
Finally from us, Woven is the first Ethiopian Screen Actors Guild film to be shot in the United States. The production follows the story of seven people whose lives intertwine after a great tragedy. I sat down with the film's yeah, co-directors, Salome Mulugeta, who joined me in studio, and Nagwa Ibrahim, who joined us via Skype. Before we begin the conversation, let's take a look at the trailer for the film Woven. You must be at peace, find peace. Choose peace. <laughs> I have not been listening to that voice for many years. out loud it will harm us. Welcome Salome and Nagwa. Thank you, you for, having for having us. us here. So your film Woven, it depicts the life of two families, Caucasian family, Ethiopian family, and they become intertwined somehow. Explain the plot a little bit more. It truly is about forgiveness, I would say, the film. Ultimately, it's about forgi forgiveness, love, and loss. And it's about um, these emotions we all have. And that emotion, wherever you're from, whether what ethnicity, what background, what religion you're from, those emotions are true to humanity. So this story, even though it's telling about these families, it parallels them, but it also talks about these issues at the same time, kind of as a thriller telling you what the accident is. Interesting. Um, so then you have a very diverse cast. Yeah, we have, uh, of course, the Ethiopian family are Ethiopian um, actors, and mm -hmm. then the Caucasian family are played by Caucasian actors. But um, it also, talk, uh, while doing, you know, showing this, it, it shows the Ethiopian culture, the wedding, the um, dance, the food, uh, it hasn't been seen here in the US before. While telling the story that I told you about, it shows the Ethiopian community, how they live once they immigrate into the United States, um, which hasn't uh, been seen because mostly now I think the Ethiopian, uh, I think it's first generation here, the, the Ethiopians that actually immigrated, immigrated into the US are about I think the first, second generation. So there was a real interest for this kind of film here. Absolutely. And, uh, and Nagwa could probably elaborate more yes, as well. please, Nagwa. Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, even though the film is about, again, an Ethiopian American family and a white American family whose lives get intertwined after this tragedy hits in New York, it's really about all families. Do you know what I mean? It's really about, as Salome said, about the universality of these emotions, love, loss, forgiveness. It's about the interconnectedness of humanity. And I think that's why this is a film that really appeals to diverse communities. 
Um, and I, for me, you know, again, even as an Egyptian American, that's why I wanted to do this film. I think another really beautiful thing about this film is it is about the immigrant experience here in the United States, which is a very powerful experience, which is a very um, prevalent experience for many communities. Again, Egyptian, um, Egyptian communities, Ethiopian communities, Nigerian communities, for immigrant communities across the world, this is a film that's really about celebrating that experience and telling it through the lens of these universal emotions. How did you guys decide to team up and do this film together, directing the film together? And Salome has been working on bringing this story to life for over 10 years, and I came wow. into the picture only about two years ago. Yeah, so she, you know, really this is a film that she, ha she has been, you know, carrying all the way through with such passion, such persistence, such determination. And, and I think actually what initially even drew me into the experience without even knowing about the film. It was meeting Salome, meeting that passion, meeting that drive. And then from there, you know, learning about the film, learning about the story, reading the script, you know, and uh, we decided to come together. And she, you know, again, gave me the opportunity to work with her on this film and, and to work with Ryan Spawn, who's also one of the writers and one of the creators of the film as well. So for me, it was an honor to be asked to be part of this project. What can people expect to see from this film? Um, I feel that when they walk out, the loss and the emotions um, that people go through each and every day is what basically what we show in this film, as well as the culture. And I think they'll see themselves in it and like see what Nagwa would say, but that's my take on it. And Nagwa, I know you guys released the trailer online. What was the response like? You know, I think that um, we got a great response and I, we're always humbled when people um, like what we are putting out artistically. I think because this is something that we don't just consider our project, we consider everybody's project. And, and again, I think, you know, going back to what Salome said, I think that this is, this again, this is a film that appeals to all human beings. And I don't mean to, you know, over-dramatize it, but it really is about the way in which we as human beings experience these really sometimes difficult things in life, but then how we can heal through them and how we can heal through them together. And I think that's what people will get from this film is not just um, a feeling of connectedness in terms of, you know, all the suffering that we've all experienced with, with losing a loved one, but also the experience of seeing healing happen and how healing happens through forgiveness. And I think that's the beauty and the power of this film that transcends, again, any labels, Ethiopian, Egyptian, American, and it, and it really connects us as human beings. And that's what we hope people get out of, that, of this film is that interconnectedness. Great. So how and when can people see the film? We're putting it into festivals and uh, after festival circuit, um, you know, then it goes to distribution. Wonderful. Um, then we'll do a screening and go from there. Salome and Nagwa, thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you for having us, Abby. Yeah, thank you so much for having us. That's our show this week. Thanks for staying tuned. Till next time, be independent-minded. <laughs>